सो गुड आफ्टरनून ऑल ऑफ यू दिस इज प्रवीण पटवारी एंड आज जैसे कि सुपर संडे है सो वी हैव अ वेरी 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 स्पेशल पर्सन टू ज्वाइन अस एम इट्स वेरी बिजी शेड्यूल सो टुडे वी हैव ऑन बोर्ड चाहत शर्मा शी इज एग्जाम क्वालिफाइड एक्चुअली एंड थोड़ा बहुत आप लोग को मैं चाहत के बारे में बता दूँ लाइक शी इज करेंटली वर्किंग इन द पी एन सी प्रॉपर्टी एंड कैजुअलिटी एरिया एंड शी हैज अ वर्क एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ मोर देन थ्री ईयर्स एंड शी ग्रेजुएटेड फ्रॉम श्रीराम कॉलेज ऑफ कॉमर्स बी कॉम ऑनर्स इन टू थाउजेंड नाइनटीन राइट सो जिनको भी इनपुट्स uh, चाहिए अपने एक्चुरियल करियर के लिए एज फार एज आई इन माई टीचिंग करियर शी इज द बेस्ट पर्सन हु कैन गाइड यू बिकॉज यू नो वेन I met her like uh, we uh, came in touch in 2019 only if I'm not wrong. So, us time se le karke, Chahat ne jo progress dikhaya hai apne professional career me, and she has excellently like managed job and like uh, giving papers at a very 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 uh, good rate. Okay, and she has been very much consistent, right? So. uh thank you jahat for joining us today now uh, the stage is all yours so you can start thank you sir for having me and for that glowing introduction i don't know how much of that i actually deserved but uh, thank you so much for having me here and thank you to each one of you for taking the time to come and listen to me speak and of course interact with me this is not going to be a monologue i will speak for a little bit and then i will definitely leave the floor open to field questions or or just concerns or anything it is that you guys want to talk about and um, yeah i'm not very old i'm your age so just ask whatever you want and um, yeah just think of me as somebody as as one of you guys um and like sir said i am an exam qualified actually i um, i wrote my final two exams in september 2020 um so that's when i qualified and my fellowship i'm on the like i've applied for a fellowship and i will be recorded as a 2022 qualifier um so so yeah that is it and i'm currently working with willis stars watson or wtw in the strategic risk consulting team so i think a lot of you would have heard of wtw and uh, the um i think the most popular team that we have in wtw is the icd insurance consulting and technology team uh, which is a great team uh, they're based out of gurgaon but i work with the strategic risk consulting team which is a smaller uh, team and we uh, we are in consulting basically uh, we provide risk and advisory advice to our clients um so so yeah that is what i've been doing for the past middle over 3 3 years and i'm going to talk about two things today first is fellowship and the path to fellowship and the second thing that i'm going to talk about is actuarial interviews um and um, so yeah i think i have a presentation and uh, sir if you should should i start sharing my screen yeah you can share okay Okay, is my screen up? Oh yes, it's visible. All right. Okay. Um. So first of all, I think I would like to begin with the most basic question: Who is a fellow? Um. So I've on your screen, you'll see all the exams that you need to write to. to qualify as a fellow but then exams are not all you also need some ppd requirements so i uh, i i wrote all my exams and i am due to become a fellow of the institute and faculty of actuaries uk so that's what i'm talking about here i understand other institutes would probably have different requirements but but yes so um if if you see the exams are grouped into four so we have the core principles the core practices specialist principles and specialist advanced the core principle papers are the most basic papers and i think a lot of you here would be writing these exams and i think these are distinct from um, the remaining three groups because they are quite math and stat intensive so they are very very quantitative papers you have a lot of maths you have a lot of statistics and all the things that you've heard about actuarial science and all those scary equations etc that you've seen those are what you will do in these papers maybe cs2 and cm2 um and you will also study r for cs1 and cs2 and then for cm1 and cm2 you will have an excel paper as well 
Um, after that, when you move to core practices, the kind of exam uh, content and the kind of exam syllabus completely changes. So there's barely any mathematics or any statistics. CP1 is completely theoretical. Now, that doesn't mean it's it's boring or, or it's something that you cannot apply uh, in real life. You cannot apply in practice. That's not how it is. Um, it's just that it's very different to the first four papers, I would say, because CB1, CB2, CB3, they're not... Uh, they, they don't have a lot of maths or statistics anyway. So the, these papers are very different to the four, first four papers. And the approach that you take for these papers is, again, very different to the approach that you take for the first, uh, for the core principle papers. Now, once you're done with all the core principles and core practices exams, you are eligible for AIA, for the AIA designation, which is the associate of the Institute of Actuaries. Now, Alongside exams, you also need 12 months, at least 12 months of work experience, at least 10 credits of uh, PPD, and at least two hours of formal learning. Now, after this, once you have your associate qualification, now this is not mandatory, you might choose to not apply for an associateship. That's what I did, um, because I was anyway left with just two exams, and I thought, okay, I'm, I'm just straight away going to apply for fellow now. Um, so yeah, so once you are done with these, we move into specialist principles. Now, as the name suggests, this is where your specialization begins. So um, if you know about the actuarial space, you will know we have life actuaries, we have general insurance actuaries, we have actuaries, uh, pensions actuaries, then we have people who, who have specialized in banking and finance or in investment and, uh, sorry, in investment. And then we also have a banking section now. So with your specialist principles exams, your, you will choose your specialization. And this is where uh, the, the paths will vary. So if you pick the life path, you will have a different set of exams. And if you pick the general insurance path or whatever else path, you will have different set of exams. Now, I am a general insurance actually. So I wrote SP7 and SP8. So these cover general insurance pricing, reserving, and capital modeling. Um, and after that comes to your final paper, after you get done with the SP exams, there comes the final last exam, which is the SA, Specialist Advanced. And I wrote SA3, which is again, uh, pertaining to general insurance. And after that, I was eligible to apply for fellowship, but I was eligible only because I also had 36 months of work experience, 20 credits of PPD that I had submitted in these 36 months and also six hours of formal learning again which i had submitted over the course of these um three years so and yeah and then you get to the you you get to probably one of the most important milestones of your early career your fellowship and uh, yeah and no more exams uh, after that hopefully um and now i'm going to talk a, a little bit about how i undertook this journey and yeah for more for the most part it, this this picture that you see here, this was me um, thinking about becoming an actuary and then actually putting in the work to becoming an actuary. These are two different ball games, and it's and I understand it's very very difficult. I've been through it, of course. Um, so yeah, I wrote my first exam in April of 2018, and I wrote my final two exams in September of 2022. So it took me five years uh, to to finish all my exams and become a fellow. Um, I graduated from college in middle of 2019. So the first year and a half I was in college. And then after that, the next three and a half years I was working uh, or outside of college. So yeah, five years, 14 exams, because I've written CT1 and CT5 separately, which later got merged to CM1. 14 exams and 38 months of PPD. And yeah, and also um, this is what you see on the surface, but behind the scenes, there was lots of ranting, complaining, stressing, and lots of crying, uh, especially once you start working because um, because you have to manage your academics with your work. So, so yeah, that was, it was quite a journey, but I think in the end, um, it's all worth it. It all makes sense. And uh, it's all worth all of this and even more. Um, yeah, I think uh, 
now I would like to talk about how to power through your exam journey. Now, we don't want to drag our feet when we are writing our exams. We want to power through this journey. We want to take every exam and we want to ace it, right? And we want to keep doing it session on session. We want to do it in the April session. Then we want to do it again in the September session. So we want to be consistent and we want to have goals and we want to keep achieving them, right? So how, how, how do you do that? How did I do that? Um, I think the first and the most important thing is prioritize exams. And this is uh, when you're in college. The next slide will talk about uh, your exam journey once you start working. But right now we're talking about when you're in college, prioritize exams. Um, I know there are a lot of other things that you can spend your time doing, especially when you're college. When you're in college, you have a lot of friends, you have a lot of free time. So there are a, a lot of ways in which you can spend that time and do that i mean do that but also study and also prioritize your exams um strike a balance and um uh, and yeah i think that is uh that is very important and that will help you because trust me if you think managing college uh, academics and actuarial exams is difficult managing work and actuarial exams is even more difficult so just do as much as you can while you are in college write exams in every attempt so like i said remain consistent so when you're in college i see that you you might be tempted to skip an attempt because you think that oh i have college exams i have internals or i have my final exams or whatever and i might not be able to prepare for actuarial exams no don't do that push yourself spend that extra time studying for actuarial exams and write those exams because trust me when you are in college and you are writing actuarial exams that is actually the relatively easier phase because once you start working it's going to get harder so yeah so remain consistent don't skip diets and um so i've been in the past couple of years obviously that i've been working we have interviewed people to join our team and one of the things that we look at is the exam progress. So is this person consistent? Is this person committed to the actuarial qualification? And if we see large gaps in exams for no reason at all, so if you have personal reasons, etc., that is a different story. But if there's really no reason and you're saying things like, oh, we had college exams or I don't know, we just uh, we were feeling overwhelmed or whatever, that is definitely a negative mark for you. So it's important to remain consistent. Next thing I think, um, I've covered this already, aim to pass as many exams as you can while you are still in college. Now, I'm not saying you should be done with the entire core principles and core practices. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying if you think you can pass three exams while you're in college, if that is the aim that you set, then make sure you achieve that aim or you achieve that goal. Or if you think you can pass maybe the first four or five exams, that will really, really take you far. And uh, that will really help you when you're working. And it might also affect your salary when you get a job. So you might be paid more than some. So if you have passed five exams, for example, you will definitely be paid more than someone who has just passed three exams. So it's going to help you with your starting salary. And then it's also going to help you um, in work, because sometimes, for example, if you get into a reserving role and you've already you've studied CM2 and you've studied runoff triangles over there, and then when you go into your job and you're doing some sort of triangulation methods, you will be able to correlate your academics, your theoretical study with your practical work. So it's going to help you there. And it's also definitely going to make your life easier when you start working because you have fewer exams to pass. Um, and last, aim to get a job in a good company. Because if you get into a good company, I'm guessing your salary will be a little bit higher. And also, you will um, you will receive a better study support package. Now, a study support package means the kind of study leaves that you get for exams and also the kind of exam increments that you get when you pass an exam. So if you get into a good company, you will receive these things. So let's let's not even talk about money right now let's talk about exam let's talk about study leaves if you're in a good company you get a certain number of days off to study for every exam and you really really need that when you start working you might think oh you can just uh, study on the weekends but it's it's very hard to do that and it it is very very helpful to have another day off so it's very helpful if you're just working four days instead of five days um, so yeah, so if you get a job in a good company, in a good team, this is one of the benefits you will receive. So definitely, definitely aim to get a job in a good company, in a good role.
in a good team where the team culture is not toxic where where your managers actually let you take study leaves and uh, yeah uh, and you actually have the time to prepare for your actuarial exams next um how to power through your exam journey once you start working again the first point is the same as the last slide prioritize your exams so when you're in college you just have co uh, college academics and then you have a lot of free time so you can still chill and study for exams you can do both those things but once you start working straight away eight to nine hours of every day are going to be dedicated to work it's going to vary between maybe seven to nine hours but on that on an average about eight hours of your day are going to be committed to work so you have less time to do other things and then in the in the remainder of the time that you have to yourself if you choose to chill or like whatever then where is the time to study for exams so once you start working you have to um actively stay committed to exams and prioritize them actively so i mean when i was studying for exams i would skip family functions very regularly i would sometimes um so maybe in in the one month or the one and a half month immediately prior to exams i would stop doing anything else on the weekends i would just stay home make sure that i'm prioritizing my preparation so these are the things that you need to do and I understand the FOMO that is associated with these things. You um, look at your friends on Instagram or, or wherever on social media, they're doing things, they're going out, et cetera. And you do feel like, oh, what am I doing with my life? I'm just sitting at home studying or working. I understand, I see you feeling that way and I have felt that way as well. But trust me, um, you set a goal and it is important to stay committed to that goal. And when you achieve that goal, all of the struggle will make sense. You will you will feel rewarded. You will feel very, very fulfilled. So my advice to you here would be hold tight, hang in there, keep your head down, keep working. And when you are through, when, when you've put all of this behind you, you will thank your past self for not giving up. And I'm sorry if I sound too cliche, but this is i i have experienced this so i'm just speaking from experience so yeah second thing order the right study study material at the right time now if you're in a good company like i was uh, I, I was uh, talking about earlier your company will probably pay for your study material now it's very important to order the right study material at the right time because if you're ordering this material from acted in the uk they're going to take about 10 to 15 days to deliver this material to you and if you and if you have so for example if you order this in february you're going to have your exam in april that makes no sense you should have ordered this material in december so that you get the material by december and you start studying in january itself so my point here is to plan your exams it's okay i know there is a lot of uncertainty because uh, we we await the exam results and we we want to see if we've passed or not and then decide the future course of action but have a plan and have two plans basically so what happens if i pass and what happens if i fail so you need to have both of these plans in place and you need to start taking actions at the right time so you need to start ordering material at the right time sometimes i mean i have made this mistake that's why i'm talking about it sometimes i got so late in ordering material that it just didn't make sense to order the hard copies anymore and i had to study from the soft copy and that for me personally is a pain because i like to study from physical books instead of studying on a laptop or a screen now third thing that yeah so we don't want to be like this person like someone who spends uh, 500 hours studying for an exam but then forgets to register so you you spend all of that time preparing but you forget to order the material or you forget to register on time we don't want to be like that we don't want any administrative errors or any logistics errors in our journey we want it to be as smooth and as um as efficient as possible so yeah uh, third thing is when you're working, you need to know how to combine exams. So you have to optimize every attempt. So for example, if you're studying for CS2, yes, CS2 is a difficult exam. I understand that. And you are also have to study for R. So that is an added burden out there. But at the same time, if you think you are okay at Excel or you're good at Excel, you can sit for CP2 along with CS2. And then when you get the results, if you've passed both exams, 
you will get obviously higher increments and um, yeah, you will have passed CP2 as well along with CS2. So, and then the kind of studying that you require for CP2 is very different to the kind of studying you'd require for CS2. For CS2, you need to practice sums, you need to do past year papers. There's a lot of mathematics, there's a lot of statistics, you need to practice R. Whereas for CP2, which is the modeling paper, if you know your way around Excel, I think you can do it. I think it's going to be very um, relatively straightforward for you. You do need to spend time looking at past year papers, past year models, and what is the kind of solution they expect you to produce. Yes, you do need to spend time doing that, but there's no actual studying, studying involved the way uh, you would need for CS2 or CM2. Uh, so definitely know how to combine exams and don't be afraid of combining exams. Don't have this stigma in your head that I'm just going to write one exam in one attempt. So know how to combine exams you can write two exams in the past one year i have written four exams and i've passed all of them so if and i did this with the final four papers so the most advanced papers this was in in april of last year i wrote cp1 and sp8 and then in september of last year i wrote sp7 and sa3 so if we can do it with the advanced papers, we can definitely do it with the initial few papers. And CP2 and CP3 and even CB3. So these are very important exams that you can combine uh, with other exams and secure an easy pass. So yeah, that and then the fourth point is again stay disciplined. I'm not going to stay, I'm not going to say stay motivated because it's very hard to stay motivated. Um, and motivation is fickle. You might be motivated. You might feel motivated one day and you might not feel motivated the next day. So that doesn't mean you only study one day and you stop studying after that. That is not how this is going to work because in the actuarial space, we often say that it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And if you want to run a marathon and you want to succeed, you have to have stamina. So you have to stay disciplined. And, and yeah, you have to make some sacrifices. Like we say here, I can't my exams in four months. So yeah, about a few months before the exams, you need to stop um, doing anything that is, I mean, not anything, of course, you need to have a time limit in mind that, okay, I've just got one month for the exam. Now I'm going to stop going out. I'm going to stop um, any sort of extra activities and I'm just going to focus on studies. So yeah, and you, just stay disciplined and i think that is that is key to your actuarial preparation now we there was a lot of talk about getting a good job and what to do after you have a job etc but then how to crack actuarial how to get a job in the first place like how how do you even manage that uh, because as we know in the recent past there has been a flooding of candidates in the actuarial space there have been a lot a lot of people who've taken up actuarial science and who are pursuing actuarial science so the competition for uh, fresher roles is very very high uh, at the same time uh, the number of roles has also increased because obviously this industry is growing and uh, India, especially uh, more and more companies are opening up offices in India. So we do have a lot of opportunities. Don't think that you are a fresher and it's going to be crazy difficult for you to find a job. No, we have a lot of opportunities. And I'm saying this from experience because three years, three, three and a half years ago when I was looking for a job. And now when I look at LinkedIn and I look at fresher uh, positions that are available, there is a huge, huge increase. So don't be scared about that. Next. Um, before how to crack an interview, um, I would like to talk about how to land an interview. So how do you even apply or how do you land an interview in the first place? I think um, there are a couple of things that you can do here. First of all, stay very active on LinkedIn. Um, you can connect with recruiters. Uh, you can connect with HR people and you can just increase the scope of your network and you can maybe switch on alerts, job alerts or whatever, or you can basically keep um, stick. Um, stay active on LinkedIn and see what job postings are available. And as soon as they become available, either apply on LinkedIn or go to the company website and apply. Also, if you know what kind of companies you want to work for, so maybe you have these three companies in mind, WDW, Aon, and Marsh and McLennan, go to their website, uh, go to their careers pages and apply for jobs. So don't just rely on LinkedIn, go to their career pages and apply yourself directly next i think there's this a uh, very good website it's called i am jobs uh, i think it's it's um you have like the good kind of jobs that are posted there 
Uh, so you can you can go and check that out as well. And we have a lot of recruiters on LinkedIn now. So uh, these people, they don't work for these companies. They work for recruiters. And these recruiters are in touch with companies like WTW, Aon, whatever. And they source CVs and they send these CVs to WTW or like whatever, these companies. So basically, the companies have outsourced their recruiting function. So connect with these recruiters, try to build a relationship with them and try to send your CVs and your profile to them um so that was it on how to how to land interviews in the first place now once you have an interview how do you ace that interview uh I, and just uh before we before i go into this slide i think i'm a little qualified to talk about this because over the past couple years i've been taking a lot of interviews uh for for my team so i think i um i'm qualified to talk about this and i'm going to speak from experience as an interviewer uh okay could you please repeat the website name for jobs it, it was it's called i am jobs i i am jobs um yeah okay so back to the slide i think when we take interviews uh there are two things we can divide interviews into two sections first is where we test the candidate's aptitude and second is where we test the candidate's attitude now if we start with aptitude uh, this is simple this is straightforward if you are going for an interview for an actuarial role we would expect to be tested on our technical knowledge. So if you say that you've passed these three exams, for example, CS1, CS2, CM1, um, the interviewers there will ask you some technical questions. And these might not necessarily be very difficult or very technical questions like Reddington's immunization or something. They might be very simple questions like, OK, just define a confidence interval for me. So it is very, very important that you uh, know your basics and you are able to articulate your knowledge. So you might know what a confidence interval is, but you might not be able to communicate that knowledge to the interviewer. So it's very important that you have these answers prepared and you also work on your communication and your articulation skills so that you can um, so that you can kind of present the kind of answers the interviewers are looking for. So the first thing is obviously technical knowledge and all the exams that you've passed. They might, they might ask you something from these exams. Um, and it's OK if you don't know uh, some very, very sort of technical questions. You can be upfront and you can tell the interviewer, I'm sorry, I don't recall or I'm sorry, I will have to get back to you on this. It's perfectly acceptable to give those answers because nobody expects you to have three exams, the material for three, four, five, whatever, however many exams you've written. Nobody expects you to have the entire material by heart. So yeah, but just be honest about um, if you don't know something. Uh, second thing is quick thinking. Um, so I've also been interviewing people who have some experience already. And I've noticed that when I ask them questions, uh, if they don't know something or, or before they even begin to answer a question, they are going to say, oh, I've not worked on this in my current role. That's OK. Even if you've not worked on this in your current role, what is it that you can you what is it that you can tell me about this topic or what is it that you can speak about the question that I've asked you? Because all of us, we are a part of the actuarial profession. We are studying for actuarial exams. So it's not just that you have to answer on the basis of your current role. You can answer on the basis of your theoretical studies, of your study of the various actuarial exams. So that I think. Personally, that is a pet peeve for me. Whenever I ask somebody a question and they say, oh, I haven't worked on this in my current role. OK, you haven't. But what is it that comes to mind? Or if you even if you don't have any background of this, how can you answer this question for me? Can you think on your feet? Can you come up with something on the spot? And can you give me the answer? Can, like whatever. I don't want a perfect answer. I just want some sort of an answer from you. So that was the easy part of the interview, I would say, the aptitude now comes the attitude and this is where we really um, test the candidates because when we are hiring candidates um, when we are hiring freshers basically you don't really have any skills um, any technical skills and we understand that we will teach you everything on the job like you will learn everything on the job but we absolutely absolutely need you to have the right attitude now, what comes under attitude? I think the first and most important thing is, are you trainable? So we're happy to have you on board, even if you even if you've just done a few papers or or you basically have or uh, no 
technical skills because that's how it is um when you are a fresher fresh out of college you don't really have any skills technical skills uh you can have sort of soft skills but yeah you don't have tech, uh, technical skills and you learn everything on the job that's not a problem we're happy to have you on board but are you trainable do you have the right attitude to be trained sometimes in interviews i've noticed uh i i have experienced this in fact we have we ask a candidate a question the candidate gives the wrong answer and we give an indication to push the candidate in the right direction that okay do you want to think along these lines maybe and the candidate is so rigid or the candidate is so uh offended that no whatever i was saying was correct so we don't so that is an instant red flag that is the kind of person we don't want in our team because when you are in a team and we're trying to train you to do work if this is the kind of attitude you have that oh i already know everything or um or whatever i was saying is correct then you cannot be trained you're you're too rigid and you're too close minded to be trained so that's not a that's not a person that we want on our team next uh how do you deal with situations so we will uh sort of ask you situational questions to see your reactions or to see how you would deal with them and uh, this could be something like have you ever been in a conflict with a team member and if yes how did you deal with this conflict so it could be this sort of a question now if you are a fresher it's fine i mean obviously you've not uh, worked in any other company before but if you are in college and you've been in maybe societies or if you've done group projects think of an instance where something of this sort had happened and how you dealt with it and don't tell them that oh i want some time to think about it right now have these answers prepared already so think about this before you go into the interview and when somebody asks you this question answer it and answer it in break your answer in four uh four parts the first is situation second is task third is action and fourth is reaction so situation is what was the situation describe the situation second what was the task so what was your task what was your responsibility um how do you fit into the picture there third what action did you take and fourth what was the reaction that you received from your team members or or the people around you or whatever so and have some examples some real life examples ready that will that will show the interviewer that you have prepared you've taken the time to prepare you've taken the time to think about this and whatever you've written on your cv is actually true otherwise if you've written things like i've been in 10 group projects and but you cannot come up with even one instance of what we've asked you it's just going to sound like your entire cv is fake so make sure you have these things already and then the third thing is have you done your research so before you go into an interview go into any job interview you will receive a job description read that job description try to understand it as much as you can and if there are words that you don't understand so for example if there's something called solvency 2 you don't know what that means but take the pains to google it so that when you speak to the interviewers you it looks we know that you've gone through the job description and we know that you've taken the pains to look th to read through it properly and thoroughly and you've taken the pains to google things that you don't know now obviously we understand you are a fresher we don't expect you to know anything detailed about it we just want to see that you've made the effort next thing when it comes to research is have you researched the company so wtw as you know it is a broking and advisory company and i've interviewed so many candidates and none of them have given me this answer that wtw is a broking and advisory company they say things like it's a consulting company okay but that's just maybe like half of the work that we do so this just shows me that you've not even taken the pains to google wtw because if you do that the first thing that will pop up is broking and advisory company and the same thing applies for uh, marsh and mclennan group of companies as well and also aon just as an fyi uh, and these three companies are actually competitors now you distinguish these from other companies like swiss re or axa which are insurance companies insurers or reinsurers so those companies are industry firms and we are consulting firms broking and consulting firms So yeah but um, the important bit here was to do your research before you go into an interview um that will just show us that will just show us that you've done uh, you you've looked at the job description you've read the job description and you've also looked at the company so in my experience i was being interviewed once and the interviewers asked me the asked me the share price of the company 
they asked me the ceo so i knew the ceo because i googled the company but i did not know the share price and it was i said it and they just laughed and they sort of brushed it off so it was all good but sometimes interviewers will even ask you these questions is the company listed on the stock markets or or which stock market is the company listed on do you know the share price and if you know this if you know this and you are able to give us answers we might we will be very very impressed because you will stand out from other candidates who don't even who haven't even read the job description properly or who who don't or the candidates that don't even know what a company does so so yeah in that scenario these are the things that you can use to make yourself stand out because no offense to anybody freshers do not have any technical skills as such you will have past exams and you can have maybe excel skills you can have r skills but everything the application of those things in r company will be taught to you on the job and not just you when i joined i didn't have like any real skills either i learned everything on the job as well so how do you make yourself stand out in that situation because when you don't have sort of like the skills uh, the the hard skills you make yourself stand out using these soft skills so that was it on actuarial interviews and i'd like to finish by saying all the best to all of you and um, thank you for listening to me and i think we can uh, take some questions now yeah so it was so nice to hear you so i am having first of all few questions <laughs> yes so uh, the first question that i would like to ask you is like there is a gap of roughly 2 to 3 months when the student is appearing for the exams and the results as you talked about little bit so uh, like what is your personal opinion like the student should wait for the results or they should start because many of them are in a uh, mind that i might not so we think of negative first hum log ke mann mein negative pehle aata hai right so how to overcome that mindset and what has personally been your uh, strategy in that yeah so i think uh, so like i said we need to have plans in place and we need to have two plans in place what happens if i pass so for example you wrote maybe you've written cs1 so you think okay if i pass cs1 i'm going to write cs2 so you that is your first plan second plan is if i don't pass cs1 then i'm obviously going to write cs1 again but i'm also going to write cb2 with it because cb2 is uh, it, it's not that quantitative in nature so you don't have as much maths or as much statistics it can be managed uh, as sort of like a secondary paper and you can have your primary paper which is cs1 so you need to have these two plans in place uh, the first plan if you don't pass uh, so sorry if you pass cs1 you're going to write cs2 uh, second if you if you don't pass then you're going to repeat it and you're going to also write cb2 along with cs1 in this scenario i think if you have an idea of how your exam went and you think okay maybe there's an 80% chances of me passing then i think you can start studying for your next exam which would be cs2 if you think you might not pass or or maybe the exam was very difficult or that's what you've been seeing on linkedin etc then maybe you can start studying for cb2 instead but to address of cs2 challenge Uh, but but yeah whatever it is uh, don't uh, just start studying either start studying for the next exam or start studying for sort of like a second year exam that you will write along with this exam just start studying because if the result comes out and you've passed your exam hopefully you passed your exam then you won't have enough time to prepare for cs2 and if you don't pass your exam then you again won't have enough time to prepare for cs1 again and also prepare for cb2 along with it so uh it's important to have a plan it's important to understand how your exam went it's important to have a realistic view so we might obviously we want to pass so we might overestimate our chances of passing don't do that have a realistic view of whether you're going to pass or not and then just start preparing for the next exams accordingly okay so my next question to you is uh like you have been a very bright student right and the uh like not having a bias but people those who are joining this course they tend to have a good mathematical ability right in their class 11 and 12 so despite being one of the top candidates you have seen lot of failures in this course right so how do you handle failures so because this is something which is inevitable in this course as far as i feel because there yeah. are 13 exams in total so how should one overcome the failure part like 
Okay, so uh, one of the exams that I failed was CM2. And CM2, we know, is a very technical exam. There's a lot of mathematics, there's a lot of statistics, uh, uh, and then there's runoff triangles. So there are a lot of new and obscure actuarial concepts as well, which is all very scary. And then we have Excel as well. So now I'm comfortable with Excel, but back then when I wasn't uh, working, uh, even Excel seemed like a big task to me. So yeah, I, the, I wrote that exam the first time and I could not pass, which was obviously very disheartening. I was very upset. And as as somebody who hasn't really failed or anything, I had not failed in anything, I think, until until that time in my life, because um, like Sir said, um, I always did well in school, etc. So, so yeah, I think it's very difficult. But like I said, um, it, it is important to have, it is important to be self-motivated. So you need so you need to have your reasons for pursuing this course or pursuing this qualification and you need to stay committed to those. So you cannot rely on your parents or your friends or your teachers to motivate you. So you cannot rely on external motivation is my point. You have to have internal motivation. So you have to motivate yourself. You have to pull yourself out of that uh, sadness of having failed an exam and you have to understand that, okay, uh, so so that is all sort of like the philosophical or whatever the that side of things on the practical side of things you need to analyze your paper you need to compare everything in your answer sheet with the examiner's report that the ifoa have published and you need to understand if you failed by five marks or you failed by 15 marks if you fail by 15 marks then there's a lot of scope for improvement if you fail by maybe two marks or three marks then that means you just need to improve your exam technique or maybe you need to exam improve the speed of writing exams or you need to attempt more questions you need to attempt more papers so i think there are two aspects first is bringing yourself out of that position okay you failed just accept that okay i failed uh, i can't go go in the past and change things now there you will have regrets like oh i wish i'd studied a bit more or oh i wish i'd studied that chapter uh, i'd spent more time on that chapter or anything of that sort but that cannot be done so so accept it and also set a new goal that in the next diet i will pass cm2 but i will also pass maybe cp3 along with that or maybe i'll also pass cb1 along with that so i will make up for this diet i will make up for my failure and i will also add another pass to my profile uh, so that's okay so uh sorry to ask so many questions so no. the next question due to shortage of time mixing two things so uh, Chahat, as far as I know you, your uh, college time, right? You have cleared most of the exams. Like if I'm not wrong, maybe uh, out of 14 exams that you have given, maybe nine, close to nine exams you have cleared in your uh, job uh, field, if I'm not wrong, right? Yes, sir. So yes, sir. like what you have mentioned in every slide, the word discipline, and we all know that motivation is underrated, right? so like what was your some piece of advice for the working professionals like it's it's truly amazing to see that you have uh been uh in a time bound manner been able to clear the course and also with majority of the things you have done in your work uh, uh time right so how was that possible like can you please guide us on that uh i can't talk about this too much but i think uh one of the most important things was my team, uh, the role that I'm in. That's why I emphasize getting a good job in a good team, in a good company. Um, so I think my team was supportive in the sense that uh, my managers or, or other people in the team, nobody expected me to work on study days. And as far as possible, we tried to manage our workload so that we, we only do our eight hours or nine hours every day. And after that, we don't let the work spill over to weekends, etc. So if that is sorted, then you have your weekends to yourself to study to plan as you as you uh, wish so i think oh, on the weekends and on the study days that i had i made it a point to study and i made it a point that my priority is studying and after that if i have any time left maybe i'll do other things uh, but right now the first thing that i am going to be doing is studying so i generally did not make plans to go out of the house or anything because if if you make those plans then uh, uh, those plans consume a lot of time so time is the most important thing here and uh, yeah just like 
manage your time and get your priorities straight if your priorities are on point your priorities are exams and your career um everything else takes a back seat to those things then i think uh it should be doable i'm not saying it's going to be easy but but i think yeah that's what i had to do and uh, yeah and besides that i think uh you have to steal time so if you have even when you're working for example if if you're in a lean period and you only have four hours of work the remaining four hours that you have maybe try to spend the remaining two hours studying i'm not saying study for the whole uh, day or whatever you spend your time relaxing etc and it's more important to relax when you're working because uh, you get more stressed etc after that do try to uh, uh, steal time wherever you can find time wherever you can and uh, put it in your studies and also very important to plan your studies efficiently so you need to know what is it that will help you pass your exams so if you've read the material if you've read the core reading it's also very important to read the questions at the, the exam style questions at the end of the chapters and then it's also very important to be very very thorough with the revision notes read and reread the revision notes and about 10 to 15 days before the exams start doing mock uh, start doing previous year papers and check your answers properly don't give yourselves extra marks check your answers and compare your answers with the examiner's report and check them properly give yourself realistic marks very often you will be failing you'll be still scoring in the 40s or 50s or whatever and you will not be even touching 60 but in those 10 to 15 days that is when you need to work on the gaps and if you can start even before if you can start maybe one month prior to the actual exam that would be even better okay so one myth buster for you like since you have cleared all the exams and most of the people that are here with us today they have done roughly four or five exams so can you please give us a outline like there is a myth that in all the 13 exams there is a lot of maths and stats involved right so what according to you is the content of the course in short like uh like can you please uh, tell in maximum how many papers you get the stats and maths content i think we only have that in the first four papers uh so when i showed my slide we had the core principles we had the core practices so if you look at the core principles exams the first four maybe cs1 cs2 cm1 cm2 these they've got maths and stats in their names so these are the papers where you will have a very quantitative approach to the material uh, but after that it turns into more practical more about the insurance industry more so uh, obviously we have life insurance general insurance and also pensions uh, so that's what it goes into and then when you move into your specialization i specialized in general insurance like i said so in the sp7 and sp8 papers we do have some general insurance concepts that if you want to price a risk how do you go about doing that so they teach you how to think so uh, and then they teach you how to think about reserving and they also teach you how to think about capital modeling a little bit of an introduction so those are technical things but the technical in the insurance or in the actuarial sense they're not necessarily mathematics or statistics so those the those subjects are about the niche of actuarial science and then you have the advanced paper which just tests your thinking that how how broad can you expand your thinking and uh, and uh, how like can you think about the same problem from multiple perspectives so that is the final paper i think uh, but the short answer to that question would be maybe like about four to five exams out of the total 13 exams okay my last question to the, uh, to you is like excel and r is already there in this course right so since you're yeah. working so what all skills a student should learn in their graduation along with excel and r so that they can uh, create their space in the uh, job market okay so i think excel is very important the kind of excel that we study for exams is quite basic uh, but before you start working if you can learn things like pivot tables or if you can learn some complicated functions like maybe index match or just be very comfortable with excel and you need to be at a point where you have a problem with excel and you have a solution you should be able to execute it using excel 
so you should know that many functions or you should know that many features of excel so i think that kind of excel knowledge will help you and along with that any coding language so if you're good at r very good but other than that i there are people in my team who are good at python and uh, they get the opportunity to work on specific projects because they know how to code um so yeah so r python whatever coding language you think you're good with um and these days we also have power bi so power bi is very useful for data visualization so you have lots and lots of data and you want uh, to make it concise you want to present your results and you want to add tables graphs charts you can do that using power bi and it's also dynamic so you can change the results in real time so i think that is also an important uh, tool nowadays which is being used extensively okay so now we'll take some of the questions which are there in the chat box so chat can you uh, answer them so sure. so uh what is a broking company like can you please elaborate someone is saying little bit on a broking company sure so when we have very large corporations uh and they want to buy insurance they will not go to an insurer directly and purchase insurance there will be some intermediaries in the process in that chain and those intermediaries are called brokers so the bro and needs like what kind of insurance do they want what is their risk and what kind of cover is appropriate for them and then they go to the insurance market and they ask insurers for quotes okay like this is the cover we want how much will you charge for also uh, insurers also need brokers because not Uh, because they also need to expand their books right they also need to write business so they rely on brokers to bring them business to bring them to introduce them to potential insureds also bro broking or brokers or brokerage is important because uh when you have very very large scale large risks on a very large scale no one insurer is going to insure the entire uh, entirety of the risk there's going to be insurance from multiple insurers and then there's also going to be reinsurance uh so that's where brokers come in okay so one question is which institute is best i guess ifo is having the best content so this i can answer so soa as far as i know that uh you might face some of the problems in the job market because it is trying to create an active space but currently uh like thoda time lagega usko apna unko apna space banane mein so ifoa i think you should go with ifoa is uh, given okay so there's a question which asks if given an option of selecting teams out of reserving pricing or capital mod modeling which one is the best um so in my team i work on all of these three things i've worked on pricing reserving and solvency to capital modeling uh so i think which one is best i think that depends on your uh, inclination what is it that you like doing the most uh also if you want to move to the uk uh because that is something that is happening in in this space so if you want to move to the uk a lot of roles there are reserving roles so if you have good reserving knowledge i think that will help you if you want to move to the uk or uh ireland or scotland or wherever uh but but besides that i think it depends on personal choice uh what is it that okay. you like doing the most okay so someone is asking about sp5 and scs definitely one day this is something that i can answer so since i am specializing in investments and finance so this is definitely a very good field uh, where you can work and currently uh, institute is taking more and more webinars and seminars related to banking and finance investments the work is increasing so definitely this is a good uh, uh, place so tanya was uh, raising the hand so can you please switch on the mic and you can ask your query <clears throat> Tanya you're there Hi uh, can you hear me Yes yeah Hi hi Chahit uh, I've written down my query but I'll just read it out also so I'm in the same college as you so um, we see that there are 100 things going on in college with everyone posting 100 types of internships PORs so how did you keep yourself focused and uh, did you at times feel that you're getting into the wrong space or 
Right. So okay. I think uh, I know. I mean, in in DU and especially SRCC, you have a million things going on all the time, literally all the time, and it might get overwhelming, and you also might feel the pressure to be involved in a lot of things like your friends. Yeah, you this was to... sorry to interrupt. This was something that we were talking about just uh, <laughs> before the uh, interview. So yeah. I guess uh, Tanya is trying to ask the same question that I was asking. So yes, so you can answer this. Yes. So for Tanya's question, I think uh, my approach was that in the first year, obviously, you get to be a part of a lot of societies. But in the second year, you only need to stay in the societies where you get a position of responsibility, because that is something you can put on your CV. Otherwise, if you are a member, uh, if you put that on your CV, that doesn't really mean anything. But if you have a position of responsibility, like you make the vice president or maybe the president, or if you're in the Comstock or whatever, you get to be the finance head or the marketing head or whatever, you can put that in your CV and you can actually do work during the fests, which you can again talk about in job interviews. Interviews. So you have to, in the first year, you may be a part of a lot of societies, but in the second year, you have to make sure that you are a part of maybe only two societies where you have a position of responsibility and make sure that those positions of responsibility are substantial. So it's not just some random role that they give you for the sake of giving you the role. Um, even if you, you, if you do something big, like maybe if you do something big like YC, uh, and you get a position of responsibility over there, then that should be it. Then I don't think you need anything else alongside that. Um, and yeah, just do uh, actual work that you can talk about and then experience things that you can actually learn from and then spend the rest of the time focusing on your uh, academics, your college academics and your exams, uh, actuarial exams, of course. And when it comes to internships, it's helpful to have an internship but it has to be a relevant internship. So if you want to be in the actuarial space, try to get an in internship in an actuarial company in the kind of role that you want to pursue after graduation instead of just doing random content writing internships or whatever. Those are not going to help you at all when you sit for actuarial interviews. Second, uh, sir, the thing that sir and I were discussing before this was when you're in um, good colleges, especially top colleges in DU, the kind of... Um, salary that is on offer from other companies from non-actuarial roles is very is quite high i would say it's even twice or thrice or of the kind of salary that is on offer for uh, a freshers actuarial role so how do you deal with that and i think um this is coming from personal experience because i've been in that place i was in srcc and there were companies like mckinsey bain bcg Parthenon, evi all of these companies that were paying uh 12 lakhs, 15 lakh plus packages, uh, whereas in the actuarial space, no matter which company you join, the starting salary is quite low. It's in the single digit. Um, so, so yeah, that was something that I felt bad about as well, especially when you look at your peers. But you have to understand the kind of growth that is available to you, the kind of scope that you have in the actuarial profession is unmatched. If you want to... Um, I, I don't like to compare things or I don't like to compare professions or people. But if you must, then you need to understand if you look at your peers, the ones who are taking up these jobs to after three years, if you have passed exams, you are a nearly qualified actuary or even a qualified actuary, the kind of money you will be earning to be able to get to that package, they will have to quit their jobs and get an MBA. So you have to understand they'll have to spend two years getting an MBA degree. Also, they're not going to be working in that period of time. So they'll spend two years for an MBA and then they'll come back and their obviously their salary will increase. Whereas you, if you keep passing exams consistently, you are gaining work experience and passing exams and increasing your salary. So you have exam increments and you also have year end increments. And if you must, you can also change your job. So when you change your job, you do tend to get a big salary hike. So um it's, it's, I understand you will feel a little uh, sad about it, but that is momentary. And in the long term, uh, it does get better. It actually gets very good. So, Okay. So we'll just keep it short. Last two queries. Ishika Jain was raising the hand and then Kanishka. Ishika yeah. Jain. Uh, yes. Hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm also a student of SRCC. So uh, I had a question. Like you said, uh, you were offered packages like 12 lakhs or 15 lakhs. So how many exams you had cleared at that time when you sat in the college placements? No, no, I was not offered. I said that the kind of companies that come to SRCC, like okay. McKinsey, 
they offer 12 lakhs 15 lakhs okay. but in the actuarial space the packages for freshers are quite low so how do you get past that comparison or how do you uh mm-hmm. i mean we don't it's it's natural to feel like oh did i make the wrong choice should i have just done something of this sort should i not have taken up actuarial science it's uh those questions they come to you naturally when you look at your peers getting such good jobs or getting such good packages but i'm but what i meant was that in the long run it all makes sense and it all your salary will increase and your uh, uh like i said for your peers they might have to quit their jobs and do an mba to be able to get to the kind of salary that you will be earning so ma'am still like uh, how many exams are considered ideal at the time when you sit for college placements i think anything between 3 to 5 should be good okay uh, and ma'am uh, in the interview like only the exams that you have cleared uh, the interviewer asks questions related to that or the ones which you have appeared and the results are not out yet what about them uh, so even the exams that you've appeared for they might ask you questions for those but that being said it's not always that simple uh, because for example say you passed cm2 now cm2 uh, actually uh, yeah if you sorry cm1 so which was ct1 and ct5 earlier so if you've passed that exam you passed ct5 for example that exam is focused on life insurance and if you apply to my team say we are a general insurance team so we might not ask you questions from cm1 because we don't have anything to do with life insurance so it's not that if you've passed three or four exams the interviewers are going to ask you questions from all of those exams you have to understand the kind of role you are applying for is it a pensions role if it is a pensions role then you need to prepare all the pension related stuff that you have studied in your exams but if you studied a life exam and you are applying for a gi role they might not ask you anything from that exam because it's not relevant to the role that you've applied for Thank you so much ma'am. Okay so last query that we're going to take is Kanishka can you please switch on your mic? Uh hi sir hi Chahat first of all I would like to correct my name is Kanishk a silent. Okay sorry. Okay. And uh, my query is uh, first I I don't want to offend anyone but then I would want a clear idea on this like which field do we uh, choose in actuarial science general insurance life insurance or uh, pensions? and we are often told that general insurance after 10 years becomes very monotonous in terms of work though it is the most high paying industry i i could be wrong but i would i just want a clear picture on this and life insurance uh, is uh, uh, is uh, moderately paying but then it's like uh, it has the most variety of work like it, it has very different domains in itself and thirdly uh, pension doesn't have a very good uh, pay scale and and when we switch jobs uh the this thing is not like we do, don't usually get good hikes so i just want a clear idea on as a like as a candidate having one paper clear like which uh, actual uh, job should i land into to have a good and promising actual career okay so the things that you said uh i have uh, first something... of all i would like to sorry chart to interrupt you yeah. first of all i would like to answer this so uh, kanish the point that you're trying to put in is uh, from like this is something that you have heard okay so as far as like like since uh, we are in this domain for the last like 9 years close to 9 years i am teaching so what i have seen is there is a lot of growth and scope in every domain okay be it pensions and be it life be it general like i have my friends working in the life and general maybe in the investment domain be it in the data analyst domain some of them are doing a trading job so the first uh, answer to your question will be you talked about being monotonous like what do you think about teaching it's also monotonous right sometimes it's monotonous and job definitely you will be getting more and more new projects but at some point of time maybe after 10 years or 15 years things will get monotonous like you are going to basically delegate those work to your uh, juniors and you will just be doing the final like maybe the checking part or maybe uh, rectifying the errors something like that after 10 to 15 years right and uh, there is a firm with, uh, with which i am associated it's a consulting firm so my principal is currently having lot of experience like more than 10 years of experience so uh if at some point of time in his life he's feeling that he, the job is monotonous or maybe it's not that much high paying he has opened his own consulting firm so it takes lot of courage to take those steps as well so uh, like this is something that i will not agree with 
like whichever field you are choosing be it pensions be it life be it general be it investments okay be it risk management all these fields are having scope but you should be updating yourself every every like every month or every six months like you should add more and more skills to your <clears throat> like uh, cv okay and uh, one more point that i would like to add to you is currently your goal should be just to uh, first clear all the exams okay and moreover talking about the fields in which you can work it's not always a choice like it, it will it will not happen to a student that the student is getting all the five areas where they can work as a job so that's also very difficult at once you graduate which field you are getting a job into so for example if there are six fields not all the six fields will be welcoming you right so that's again a challenging task in this field so let's say suppose uh, if uh, i am also a qualified chartered accountant so in campus placements if i'm not getting uh, the domain of investment banking or maybe consulting then i might not be able to step into that field i might not i might uh, need to work in some other field for maybe 6 months and i keep trying consistently improving myself to get that domain so that's also very uh, like uh, case to case basis like chahat uh, got into general insurance right but it's not that chahat got a job offer from all the fields and it was a choice for her so that is also very important thing to note and one more question in the chat box is uh, someone has started their career in uh, 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 uk retirement and pension it's not that the field is dying but what i would like to point out is if you are getting something better always try like some of my friends they have worked in the pensions domain and they have like shifted to life domain general is very difficult it's not possible from pensions you might be able to shift to the life domain but again it's quite difficult to switch okay and your experience might not be counted in totality so for example if you write in your cv you are having 2 years of experience in pensions that might not be counted as equivalent to 2 years of experience in life so that's a bit difficult thing for you one more but definitely don't do a job ki iska growth nahi hai and isme dying thing hai aisa nahi hai right it's not that because if you see in a broad like every company be it the smallest of companies they have the compulsory uh, thing for pensions okay so every company needs to have pensions so uh, like it's a huge field to work so it's not like that but definitely in the meantime if you're getting something very much better in some consulting or maybe some core company in life or general or health whichever field you you want to work then definitely go for that and if there is some a field in which you want to work you should consistently work for that you should consistently try and uh, try and try to get into that space that is very important so it will not be the case that companies will come to you you need to basically be very active on linkedin and need to consistently like apply for those jobs that is very important so that's it uh, so thank you all of you for joining okay and thank you so much chahat for making it today uh, i'm i'm really glad that uh, you joined us today so it was an thank amazing you, session so isko hum log dalenge sab jagah pe theek hai thank you so much Thank you, sir, and lots thank you everybody of, for your time. Uh, lots of blessings for your uh, future you, career. Sir. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.